in and um, you know some technical assistance, applied research, and so that's kind of the connection with with Cooperage and, and UNH. Uh, my my information's right here on this slide, and I'd love to hear from you afterwards if you have any thoughts. You know, well during the program, during the comments, but also afterwards if you want to follow up, I'd, I'd love to speak with you as well if you want to talk further. There we go. In terms of an agenda, I have about 25 slides. So I think, you know, we may go 25 minutes or so of talking. Um, Want to cover a little bit just on Cooperage in general, uh, and then kind of the current state of Cooperage in New Hampshire and New England, a little bit kind of at a pretty superficial level, the manufacturing process and, and some of uh, the steps associated with that or considerations. Um, and then our specific efforts at UNH, you know, to develop a market around Cooperage and, and sort of our, our next steps. So just a little bit about kind of the, the origins of barrels. Um, you know, it's not necessarily a new product. It's been around for a couple thousand years. Um, generally, the, the Celts are um, the ones that folks attribute to first producing barrels, but um, their kind of widespread use was a result of uh, Romans and kind of that Roman expansion. I guess military logistics, you know, aren't something new. And back then keeping the soldiers happy was important. And they did that through, um, you know, transporting basically alcohol and food, you know, following the, the legions around. And, and so that's really how barrels became more widespread. Um, and then it, it kind of spread from there. And I think the idea is that, um, you know, barrels um, have been popular for a long time because they're durable. You know, anytime you're transporting goods, they're, they're pretty resistant to, to shock and do a lot better than clay. Um, and also wood's abundant. So, you know, anywhere they're growing trees, almost anywhere they're growing trees, in theory, they could be producing barrels. Um, there's a couple different, I'm gonna use barrels and casts interchangeably. And, um, but anytime they're using, um, yeah, so, um, and then the other thing is just, there's a couple different sorts of barrels, you know, when we're talking about it. So there's slack cooperage, it, which are barrels that are produced for really dry goods. You know, you think of sugar over history, sugar, salt, salt cod, you know, uh, fruits, vegetables, those kind of things. And then we have tight cooperage, which are those barrels that are holding liquid. Um, and a lot of our research is more on the tight cooperage side, you know, around alcohol and alcohol production and storage in barrels. But um, there's also this other, whole other aspect of um, being able to produce, um, you know, slack cooperage. So producing barrels for, um, for those dry goods. So as I mentioned, you know, uh, barrels were produced for, you know, good, many, you know, a couple thousand years, uh, but more recently, uh, they sort of been displaced by newer materials. So you think of, you know, all the plastics over the last hundred years or so, you know, barrels have been replaced by plastics. And when you think of storage containers and how you store your food around the house. Um, also, you just need to go to any, you know, your favorite brewery or what have you, see the, the kegs delivered, you know, and they're, they're not delivered in barrels, they're delivered in steel uh, kegs. So, um, you know, as such, kind of the amount of barrels produced in certain regions has declined or overall has declined, but particularly in these areas where we, um, we're not producing whiskey, there's very little reason, re reason in the Northeast, since we don't produce a lot of whiskey to keep producing barrels, you know, when they're being substituted for other plastics, but you find down South, and I guess to me, you know, being in New Hampshire, everything's down South, right? But um, so down south, you know, they continue to have a pretty strong um, cooperage market and, and production facilities because of all the whiskey that's being produced. But now over the last, you know, 20 years or so, because of, you know, craft distilleries, craft breweries, all those kind of things, um, you know, there's real demand, at least in New Hampshire, in New England, uh, for barrels, for local barrels, uh, but we have very little supply, as we'll, we'll talk about. And um, you know, barrels can be used for all different products. They're not, or alcoholic beverages, and not every single beverage uses a barrel, but, you know, wineries, breweries, cideries, uh, distilleries, they all can use barrels, um, depending on what they're trying to do. 
at different stages of the production process. And, um, you know, there is a little bit of complexity when we're thinking about how they're used, when they're used, for what purposes. Um, you know, so there's a little bit of, you know, generally a cast life cycle where um, distilleries and wineries are, are basically using newer barrels. Um, they're used for a while, depending on what they're producing and, um, you know, certain specifications. Then often those used barrels are sold to breweries or cideries and, you know, maybe having some of that whiskey flavor is beneficial for, you know, what the brewery or cidery is trying to produce. Uh, they may use them for a while and then um, the barrels can be sort of retired to secondary forest products, you know, so different sorts of furniture are made out of kind of used barrels that, that don't have any other kind of life to them, uh, tabletops, you know, flooring, all those kind of things. So we'll move into New England cooperage and um, you know, this is it's sort of tough. We were producing around 500 barrels a year uh, up until recently, a couple, probably 18 months ago, two years ago, and we had three coopers uh, that I'm aware of that are making new barrels. There's some other folks and one larger facility that repairs a lot of barrels, but in terms of new barrel production, there's really only a few people that I was aware of. Um, and you know, so we were making about 500 barrels a year. A couple of years ago, um, one of the cooperages, so one in Vermont burned down. And so he's rebuilding, but really just repairing barrels at this point. Then due to COVID, I was just talking to a gentleman up in uh, Maine who was doing most of the rest of the production. Uh, and he kind of got pulled into another business because his business partners weren't able to, um, you know, be around due to COVID. And so he's not producing new barrels. So at this point, we're really down to producing less than 100 new barrels a year, um, despite significant sort of local demand, regional demand. Just to put that in perspective, you know, you look at something like a Jack Daniels plant that puts out 1,300 barrels a day. You know, it's sort of like by the morning coffee break, you know, they produced all the barrels that we're going to produce in a year around here. And so for the alcohol manufacturers in the region, they're all, you know, quote, importing barrels from uh, the Midwest, down South, um, you know, but they're, they're really not getting a whole lot locally. Um, our last commercial cooperage in New Hampshire closed about 20 years ago. And again, they're sort of missing that window of opportunity when kind of that craft brewery, craft alcohol beverage kind of movement really accelerated. So I don't know, maybe a couple of years ago, me and a colleague at um, UNH Brewing, so we have this um, brewing program um, and Cheryl Parker is the, the faculty there. And we've been working on a lot of this stuff together. You know, we did some market research and reached out to all the different distilleries that we were aware of in New Hampshire, all the wineries, all the cideries and a number of the breweries sort of get a better sense of how they're using wood in their uh, manufacturing process. And, um, you know, with the hope that we really cared about barrels, but, you know, we didn't know what we didn't know. And so maybe there was some opportunity to use local wood that we didn't know about. Um, and what we ended up finding was that really, um, there was just really a lot of interest in getting local barrels if they could get it, but they either didn't know they could, understandably, because there's not much supply, um, or they said they, you know, you just couldn't get it. Um, and then there was some interest in alternatives. So another thing we were looking at, which I'm gonna talk about is producing barrels out of alternative woods. Um, that's also, you know, something that, that we did a bit on. Um, and then, you know, just, I guess a little bit unrelated, but just something that I found interesting talking with them was that there's, with a lot of their customers, there was a real interest in, in you know, you think of this buy local movement and a lot of their customers, they wanted a local product, but they really didn't go beyond the, the beverage that they were buying, you know? So they were buying local beer, they were buying local spirits, but they didn't know or necessarily care where that barrel came from, you know, or, or where the um, ingredients came from for the, for the actual um, alcohol. So um, despite the fact that that end user probably didn't care too much about, um, you know, local barrels, local ingredients, 
the producers themselves seem to really have an interest in it. Let's see. Um, all right. So I'm not going to get too much into uh, the terminology with barrels, but you know, I, I didn't know who the audience would be. There's a range of different folks. I just wanted people here to know, you know, there's different terminology for different parts of the barrel. Um, I think the only thing I'm gonna really be talking too much about are staves, which are those kind of lateral slats in the barrel that, that make up, you know, most of it, the wood slats going all the way around it. Um, and just something that I, oh, I should point out, you know, that barrels are toasted to different levels. Um, so, um, and depending how charred they are on the inside, that can impart different flavors and there's different uh, reasons, you know, that um, whoever's producing the alcohol will, will look for these different chars, different amounts of toast. Um, I just wanted to point out, because I find this really engaging and, and fascinating barrels and it's something that always pulls me in. And when I saw this um, sort of diagram on the left, it sort of captured it for me. You start looking at all the different angles, like how does someone actually put a barrel together? This is just incredible to me. You know, you look at the different dimensions of the stave. So up on top, there's an angle to the top of the stave. Um, if you look down on it, it's, it's sort of bowed a little bit, right? Um, looking at it from the front, same thing, you have this, um, sort of bow in it as well. And then you're bending the whole thing and all those different sort of attributes all have to come together. All those different angles all have to come together, um, you know, and not let out any liquid. It's just um, fascinating to me. And for those that probably are newer to kind of how those barrels are put together, they probably have the same kind of uh, response. So just to talk a little bit about how you know, just very generally what um, coopers are looking for when um, they're putting together a, a barrel, there's certain attributes um, uh, that they need with the wood. So one is air dried wood that's been dried for, you know, often a year or two, a couple of years, tends to be pretty good with the folks that I talk to. Um, and quarter sawn wood's really important. Uh, if you look in the center of, well, if you look at the top of the screen here, um, you can see there's different kinds of sawing patterns. And um, depending how wood's cut up, there's gonna be different grain orientation in the lumber. And what, um, and what coopers are looking for, what you want in your staves is this quarter sawn lumber. So wood that's sawn up in these kind of dimensions, sort of that second log in, if you can see where it says quarter sawn. And what that results in is, you know, in that picture, that grain orientation of very vertical in this case, um, you know, grain orientation. And that's a deliberate process that has to be done fairly deliberately if you want reasonable yields of quarter sawn wood. So it's not like, you know, you can go to your local sawmill and they're just gonna have a bunch of quarter sawn air, two year old air dried white oak around here at least, you know, that's of the right specification. So it has to be really deliberate if you're trying to provide a supply for a cooperage around here. Um, also, you know, white oak is a preferred species and has been a preferred species. Well, you know, over time, other uh, tree species have been used. White oak is, is really the industry standard. Um, and I think part of that's just it's, it's less, um, uh, less porous than other woods are. So with the new, or as um, cells die in white oak and become heartwood, uh, there's some changes in um, in, in those cells and in that heartwood. And one of the things that develops in a lot of these um, cells is what's called tyloses, and it's just sort of a, a clog. So if you think of um, a log as being a bunch of straws that sucks up water, you know, when it's alive, as these cells die, those straws can kind of get plugged up. And so that helps make them less, you know, that's the best analogy I can come up with. But, um, you know, those clogged up, clogged up pores really make it less porous. Um, and should hold water or hold liquids better than some other species. When producing um, barrels, uh, oftentimes coopers will look for, or cooperages will use heartwood in white oak. And you can see um, 
I sort of shaded it in in the lower picture. That's the heartwood. Up above, you can see a discoloration between the sapwood, the lighter wood on the outside. Then again, that heartwood that's a little darker on the inside. Uh, we're going to talk about producing barrels with alternative species a little bit later. Um, what we did is we actually used sapwood in our staves for the barrels we produced. And a big part of that, and you know, I'll get into it in just a moment, is that uh, in this region, we're, we're really at a disadvantage from a cost of production standpoint. We're not going to make barrels as cheaply as they do elsewhere. Um, but in order to catch up and make it as cost effective as possible, we felt like it was important to at least try to use sapwood in um, these alternative, you know, barrels, alternative species barrels. Um, or else you're already at kind of this cost disadvantage and then we're using species that don't have a lot of heartwood. Um, and then getting really very little yield from it, it just becomes this untenable thing where, you know, it's just totally unrealistic. So we can talk more about that if anyone's interested a little bit later, but uh, just wanted to point out for the barrels we made with alternative species, we did use sapwood. Also with, um, you know, production, I'm not going to get into the details of the table, but this idea that different uh, barrels of different sizes uh, will have different specifications, so different length staves, different thicknesses, different widths, and so on. Uh, and then one other big difference between, or that we're grappling with, is um, in New England, you can see over on the right, you know, that's really how, uh, how our, most of our Cooper shops look, you know, it's, it's very uh, more labor intensive, more of a craft experience, uh, versus other parts of the country where everything's much more mechanized, um, you know, working off production and, you know, that drives the costs down per barrel. And, and that's something that, um, you know, again, we just sort of grapple with as we move forward, figuring out um, the right pathway in order, order to be competitive or produce a product, a good product at a lower uh, price. So I'm going to talk a little bit about all right uh, UNH efforts now um, around Cooperage. So as as I mentioned, you know multiple times, uh, we know that we in this region, you know, we don't quite have the same uh, supply of white oak. Uh, we don't have the same size facilities and setup and infrastructure. So if there was a more viable market that we're trying to develop, Cooperage industry, you know, that we're trying to develop. Um, our thinking was, you know, you, it really has to be something that's unique, um, that's that you can't substitute with a lower cost product. And we approached that a couple of different ways. So one was looking, as I mentioned earlier, with alternative species and preferably those alternative species that grow in the Northeast. Um, so that's kind of unique to our region. Uh, and then the other part was looking at our white oak that's growing in New England and trying to figure out if there's uh, unique attributes associated with them. Um, that differentiates them from white oak growing in other regions. I'll start with the alternative species. Um, so again, working with uh, Cheryl Parker over at UNH Brewing, uh, we, she had her class uh, brew up a, a base beer, a really kind of base beer where you could uh, pull out a lot of flavors. Um, we sawed up a bunch of different uh, different type species of um, wood, you know, different tree species, chopped them up into little blocks and uh, through their brewing process, they added them, you know, they had them as additives to see what the flavor profiles would be of these different species. So red maple, black birch, aspen, white pine, and beech. And we found aspen and white pine was undrinkable. It was horrible, horrific. So I'll, I'll save you the effort if anyone wants to replicate this, avoid aspen and white pine. Um, uh, but red maple, black birch, and American beech, uh, you know, had fairly uh, decent characteristics that would make, that would lend themselves to maybe some different um, beer styles. Um, and I should also mention that, so they, um, Cheryl worked with her class to, to brew these beers. Um, but also invited in a number of uh, head brewers from uh, a number of breweries around. And we had a sensory uh, panel where they came in, did their tasting notes, 
Um, so it's really the brewers themselves that were evaluating this, not us or the students. So the students participated. Um, you know, it's really these head brewers saying, oh yeah, this would be good for, you know, this style of beer. Or, no, this wouldn't work. Um, and it was working with them to see what they might be interested in. Uh, as a result of that, we quarter sawed a bunch of, you know, of different species, but ended up producing barrels out of um, American beech and, and black birch. Um, and the cooper was Ron Raisless in, in Portsmouth. And so he does kind of these older, you know, he's not necessarily a production cooper, but, but produced these barrels for us, which we're really grateful for. He was great to work with. Um, and then also Northwich Brewing Company took the barrels and uh, use them for some of the beers they were producing. And then we had an event around it. Uh, we started with some, with the beach casts and um, they were just leaking like crazy. So they were leaking through. Uh, I should also step back. And I, so I talked to some different um, uh, sort of wood anatomists that were, um, you know, pretty good with, with wood tech and, and sort of understand wood structure and, and how it functions. And I got some differing opinions. So some people would say, um, you know, diffuse porous wood, so beech, uh, red maple, uh, beech, or birch, those, sh those really should hold liquids. You know, I don't know why people don't use it. Some other people said, oh no, um, uh, there's no way this is gonna work. So some of, you know, our faculty experts sort of in this, in wood anatomy and, and that have worked with this kind of thing in the past, and, um, you know, provided input and there were differing opinions. So that's why we sort of tried this out as well. You know, we weren't sure how it would hold liquid or not. And so with, with the beach itself, um, it, was, it was leaking, um, actually not through the, I should say, um, it was leaking through the sapwood. So that was the biggest issue. It was going through the staves itself and, and not necessarily uh, between, the, between the joints. Uh, which told us that there was an issue with the wood itself and the permeability of the wood. And this one wasn't under a lot of pressure either. Uh, so we substituted that barrel out for another beach barrel. Same thing happened, you know, except even worse. But again, it was leaking through the wood just everywhere, but particularly the sap wood. Um, so we felt like, you know, that was really not a good option and trying to figure out how we could salvage something from it. Oops. Um, so then we substituted that for the black birch and it worked fantastically. Um, so no leakage at all, you know, held everything in. Everyone was really excited, um, ended up producing the beer, having an event. Uh, this was the beer and it, it tasted great. And so working with Northwood Brewing Company, they said, you know, if and when we can get out to um, some of these brew festivals, we're happy to do it again and sort of interact with the public and talk about it. So another big part of this project of research we were doing was trying to connect folks um, to sort of products that they care about that come from the woods, you know. So I heard um, a state forest or an adjacent state once say like people, um, they love their woods and they love the final product, but nobody likes harvesting, you know. And I think folks are connected to beer, they're connected to the products, they're connected to their, their land but not a lot of people are connected to how you go from getting from the land to that product you care about. And this was an effort to try to get people that maybe typically didn't interact, you know, or think about um, forest products to be excited about them. So the other pathway we took, um, as I mentioned earlier, was um, looking at New England white oak. Is there something unique about the white oak we're growing um, that's different from other regions? So I got samples from 50 samples across New England from New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, Connecticut, a couple from Massachusetts, but really representative of the geographic, you know, area of New England. Uh, sent it out to a, a cooperage in France that has their own um, R&D lab, you know, and um, they ran <laughs> gas uh, GCMS analysis. Um, so I always trip up on it, but uh, basically what this does for us is tell us it's kind of, um, you know, the unique kind of chemical attributes and substances within this white oak. Within their proprietary database, they had, they'd done the same thing for white oak in the Midwest 
impact area. So we were able to sort of compare the differences between our New England white oak and white oak from the Midwest. And what they found um, was that there was no statistically significant with these with these samples, you know. Um, however, there was significantly significant statistically significant differences between, um, between New England and the Midwest in terms of trans whiskey lactones and also tannins. And so I'm sure there's other folks on here that could speak much better to um, how this could be used and why this would be important. And I don't pretend to know the nuances of that, but I do think that when we're talking about flavor profiles and uh, preferences and sort of recipes of sorts and how wood would affect flavor, I think differences are important. And I'd assume, you know, that depending on the recipe you're trying to build um, and what you're trying to do, um, you're looking for different things for each situation and also depending on the specific type of alcohol you're producing. You know, so I sort of think of it as, you know, chocolate, milk chocolate, if you can show that milk chocolate's different than dark chocolate, you know, I'm not sure if that's good or bad, but it's certainly helpful when you're starting to make your recipe, right? Sometimes, you know, you may want your milk chocolate with the Twix and then when you're doing your bacon, go with the dark chocolate. As a result of that, we got a certification mark for our New England white oak. And that means that our cooperages here, you know, could, we're going to um, use this in order to differentiate their product and be able to market it both locally. And then also if there are other regions that sort of want this different product, they, um, we could market it that way. Um, and and in a more significant way than just sort of saying, oh, it's from the, the Northeast, you know, it's certified New England white oak. Uh, we're in a little bit of a bind, as I mentioned, where we just don't have the capacity in terms of the Coopers to, uh, to take advantage of this. But given uh, the market demand for our different pro four barrels in the area from alcohol manufacturers, it seems like, um, you know, there's an opportunity for somebody and we're now trying to work through that process of identifying a good match uh, for, you know, bringing in a cooperage here and, and um, supporting them. So as I mentioned, we have this regional market, you know, folks that want barrels, but we just don't have the manufacturing capacity. Um, and then there are supply chain issues, as I mentioned earlier, we don't, you know, mills are not sawing up uh, white oak, um, you know, for quarter sawn lumber for staves, you know, we don't really have stave stock lying around. Uh, nonetheless, I think the supply chain issues will resolve themselves pretty quickly if we could get a manufacturer in here, you know, in an actual cooperage of sufficient size and scale um, to have a, a, a reasonably um, priced product. And so, as I mentioned, you know, we're trying to, again, reach out. I think at this point, you know, uh, it seems like our existing Coopers are not in a position where they can expand. It would be great to support them and support our local businesses, but we're at a position where that's just um, not realistic. So we're, I think, going to more aggressively reach out to the broader area and um, broader region and to areas where there are Cooperages and seeing what kind of partnerships um, an interest there is outside of New England uh, to bring in um, or to, to, to have a facility here and what that facility looks like, the scale, you know, whether it's a satellite sort of thing or more of a cooperage situation we would just see, but hopefully um, someone can do something with this. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you know, there's, if we can take that step, you know, working on sort of that supply chain and smoothing that out and then additional market research to the extent it's of interest and, and supports these efforts. And so that's all I have for now. Hopefully you found that enlightening and um, interested in the questions folks have. Andy, can we, um, uh, I have some comments and maybe we, you can close your screen and we can let everybody be back yeah. here. Great, thank you. Um, in, thanks so much. In the chat box, 
Um, there's a question, is there any work or research looking into the political side of cooperage, such as bylaw distillers have to use as laws that distillers have to use white oak for a specific style of whiskey or bourbon or something. Somebody comments that they know that that's true in Illinois and Ohio, as long as it's a whiskey. Yeah, um, Do you know anything about that? I'm not aware of it, but if that was of interest, I'm happy to follow up and we could, um, you know, let them know what those laws are, if there are any. And so again, I'm just going to put my email address and phone number in the chat box and folks should contact me with any questions afterwards too. If anyone else has a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask Andy or type it in to the chat box. I do got a question uh, follow because I was also the one that, that typed in uh, about the particular styles is, is I've always been under oppression uh, and run a distilling business here in Illinois uh, that, that to have a particular style of whiskey, it has to be uh, white oak. So if we want to have a wheat whiskey or a bourbon, uh, that it has to be a new white oak barrel. And I do want to know if there's any clarification on what new white oak barrel is. We're working with a, a local cooper, and the idea of recuperage is definitely an interest of ours. Is is that considered new oak, or is that used oak? Yeah, so again... I think these are not issues that have really come up too much around here just because we haven't had that manufacturing ability right now, you know? So I think, um, I feel like there's probably not a lot of laws. I don't want to speculate, but you know, those kind of issues just aren't um, things that I've heard about. And, uh, but I could definitely look into, you know, specific laws around here and I defer to, folks in other states, you know, about how you're dealing with some of those questions. There's a comment here from somebody from West Virginia, um, the Forest Service, I think there. Great job, Andy. Oh, nice. Thank Thanks, Al. Yeah. But, yeah, no, I'm I, I'm, again, I'm, I'm curious to hear, you know, folks from other states sort of, um, I guess, what your impressions are, maybe um, sort of how successful in other states smaller cooperages are in competing with the larger ones. You know, um, I guess we probably shouldn't get into pricing so much, but, you know, are there appropriate uh, niches for different size cooperages, um, you know, in your respective areas? Here's another question. What about red oak? Was that explored? And then the logging industry makes it difficult. Oh yeah, um, so red oak was not explored. It just wasn't something that um, the folks that I talked to felt it would be um, a good product. Um, and I, I don't think there's been much success in other regions using red oak. Um, and I'd be curious what the comment is in terms of the, the logging industry making it diff difficult. Uh, I can step in on that. Yeah. So red oak doesn't work because of the cell structure. It lacks tylosis. Uh, the xylem and phloem uh, work differently. Um, uh, a red oak barrel would basically be a sieve, a geeson. Um, my question with the logging industry, um, it, at least here in Illinois, um, and any of the good white oak is immediately claimed by the uh, laminate shops or independent stave company. It makes it really difficult for a small uh, nano cooperage like myself to uh, lay claim to any good oak. Yeah, so I think um, around here when we're looking at white oak supply, I mean, I don't think that this would be a region where 
there could be a huge cooperage, you know, industry. I think it would be appropriately scaled for the region um, and be, yeah, a niche market serving um, the local region and then also potentially outside of that if folks felt, you know, some of that sort of research that we do um, is something worthwhile and unique. You know, if there's a unique flavor, folks outside the region, you know, have interest in New England white oak barrels. I think most of, um, so white oak isn't a huge, it depends where you are in New England. As you move further south on uh, Connecticut, you know, Massachusetts, you, you have quite a bit of, quite a bit more white oak. As a percentage of the forest, it's not a huge percent, but across New England, you have, you know, whatever, you know, billion board feet. And so, there's an opportunity for a good few barrels. And then in terms of other products, I don't think there's, I mean, there's some uh, kind of niche boat, boat building markets, but there's stuff like trailer decking and it kills me to see, you know, white oak go into trailer decking instead of into a higher end product, you know, like a, a stave and that I think of as almost like furniture, you know. Yeah, red oak would be a good use for uh, trailer decking. Um, it, it's, you know, Northern Oak, uh, being from New England, and uh, I spent three years at Fort Devens. Uh, I love New England. Uh, but Northern Oak is the best oak. It, you know, whatever with the Ozarks Oak, you know, the, the growth rings are so much closer, obviously, shorter growing seasons in the north. Um, you know, my clients uh, are looking for Illinois Oak. Um, and it's just really difficult for me to lay my hands on anything. Um, but yeah, there's certainly a niche market um, for small coopers uh, to be able to, you know, make, you know, hundreds of barrels a year out of white oak if we can get our hands on it uh, versus the macro cooperages, you know, making, you know, thousands a day. I wanted to tie on that. So uh, uh, we are Lauren, who was recently talking uh, one of his clients and uh, predominantly looking for more and more Illinois white oak. But we, we started to look at the cost and while uh, he runs double the cost of a manufactured, you know, mass produced cooperage, uh, we calculated out and even to classify under the, the analogies of what, you know, we take for whiskey, if it needs to be a new white oak for a specific you know, specific type of whiskey, we're changing our our labels in order to recouper some of these barrels so we can at least still have whiskey without having a style of whiskey. And with the thickness of his staves, we should be able to recouper four times. And with the cost uh, of those barrels, it equals uh, at most 8% of the entire uh, bill of whiskey production whenever it comes down to it. So it's less than 10%. You're getting, you're supp supporting a local business, you're driving local economy, uh, producing local barrels. And at the same time, when you counter in the fact that you can recoup for these barrels, it is more cost. It, it, it's, it's better for the industry than it is to buy mass produced barrels that are a once and once and done. Uh, the fact of having a local cooper that you can recouper with makes it financially feasible. Yeah. And so I think there's a little bit of the recoupering, you know, that's happening around here and no capacity for, for new barrels. Um, Andy, there's another question here. It's, um, I'm not aware of any cooperages in Michigan, certainly not large cooperages if they exist here. However, I've heard recently of a few smaller band mill operations that were considering producing stave stock for the local brewing industry. More to follow up on. And, Don't uh, do it, Dave. This is, this is our thing. Don't <laughs> deal it in Michigan. No, sorry. Just kidding with Dave. All right, go ahead. Yep. Uh, and did yellow birch have any potential for use in cooperage or black gum? And there's a lot more questions here. Um, what, what's the going rate for a barrel? And what kind of cost to the purchaser? 
Yeah, so our, our black birch, you know, I guess we'd have to see how yellow birch and black birch would would do. But, you know, assuming that they'd act fairly similarly, um, I was really, we were all surprised that um, black birch, again, with sapwood, you know, had good flavor and held liquid. So that was exciting and we'd like to replicate it with more barrels. But also I should say all this work was unfunded or, or I think we had a, a thousand dollar, I should actually give uh, New England Society of American Foresters provided a thousand dollar grant for all this work that was done, um, which was really generous to them. But in terms of research dollars, this was essentially, you know, we don't, we don't have any funding to do this because it's always challenging to get grants uh, for a product that may not, for something that, you know, you may not have a deliverable at the end or a success story. So it was a little bit, you know, tricky telling the story for it and just worked our way through a lot of these issues. But um, yeah, so Black Birch, we'd love to use that again, but we just need to, you know, figure out how to buy more Black Birch and get it all sawn up and stuff um, and produced. You know, where are Coopers? We didn't look at black gum because around here, our black gum is really slow growing and um, uh, fairly unique natural communities. So we wouldn't want to get into there. Um, and some of them are, you know, hundreds of years old. So it's, we, we'd want to stay away from that. Um, you know, I don't know about pricing. I shouldn't talk, you know, too much, but it seems like we're probably, I'll, I'll talk about, you know, to get my 20 gallon barrels produced, they're $350 a barrel, which, um, you know, and that's basically a, a, a handmade, you know, barrel from someone that does essentially historic replicas. Um, and so that would have to get, you know, passed on, you know, through to the consumer and so on. But you know, hopefully the the price would get pushed down if, if there were more efficiencies in the production. Any other questions? Sure, um, Andrew. Uh, this is Polly. I'm I'm here at Cook Library with Amy, and you asked about small cooperages elsewhere in the country, and my brother-in-law created a successful small cooperage in St. Louis. He creates um, large fooders out of white Missouri white oak. Great, yeah. Yeah, and he really, he was the only, I don't know if he still is, but he, for, for at least a long, long time, and I probably still, he's the only fooder maker in the United States. All the rest come from Europe. Um, so he's been really successful getting those fooders to, uh, to brewers who are brewing and fermenting their sour beer. Yeah. So that was, I'd, I'd love to talk with him if we're not a competitor, because that's the other, you know, project that I really wanted to look at was getting some of those produced, you know, because we have so many breweries around and there's a lot of um, breweries that have sour styles and stuff like that, that I yeah. think having a local, you know, smaller fooder producer or a uh, producer of smaller fooders would be really, really neat. And that's something that, you know, a lot, a lot of breweries have talked about here too. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm happy to connect you two. Thank you. David says, whoops, Andy, I spoke too soon. <laughs> Andy, can I ask why a lot of your research has been uh, beer cooperage base and not whiskey cooperage base? Um, yeah, so I would love to connect with anyone that wants to work with me on additional research. I think uh, when I first was talking about some of this, folks thought I was nuts. And, um, you know, I think some of it... Um, so I, I think, yeah, so I guess we started with beer because, you know, we were looking with the alternative species. We didn't know how well the barrels would, would hold up and how well they'd hold liquid. So I think, um, you know, much better to lose 20 gallons of beer and people are much more understanding of that than, um, you know, with whiskeys. But um, there's definitely interest from some whiskey producers. It's, it, there was just limited funding. We started with, um, you know, those alternative species and then the, 
the white oak research, but we haven't produced any white oak casts, which would go into you know more of this kind of research because we don't have any coopers. So it really is this issue now of um, just we need we need a cooperage here. They they they'd be a monopoly, you know, essentially. So it feels like if there was someone that wanted to serve this market, um, there's a very open space, and and we're just kind of working on that. But if there's uh, research I can do with anyone out here, you have you know questions and things we can work on. I'd love to do that.